Okay. So the stock is called a guardian angel of file systems, monitoring for file system errors in data centers. My name is Gabriel. I work for Collabora. Uh, I'm a kernel developer for a lot of years now. Um, and Collabora is an open source software consultancy. We work for uh, several different uh, customers who approach us with specific issues on parts of the stack. They help us. They ask us to help them uh, optimize the use cases they have, solve specific bugs. We are specialized in helping companies succeed using open source. Uh, so this was going to be a virtual talk, which is why I have a slide about me. But uh, since I'm here, um, let me go really quick here. As I said, I'm a kernel developer. You might know me from some work around gaming and Linux. I'm the developer who implemented uh, case insensitiveness support in ext4, who was later adopted by F2FS. Uh, I also worked quite a lot on a feature called originally Futex Weight Multiple, which later became the new Futex 2 interface. And most of that is to optimize use cases of gaming on Linux. Makes game, make games run faster, make games run better. Maybe games that, that were brought from the Windows world, so we're trying to emulate them via Proton, or games that were natively designed uh, on Linux. I'm also the maintainer of a subsystem, a very small subsystem in the kernel, uh, the Unicode subsystem, which is used for uh, case-insensitive file systems. But today, this talk is not about gaming. I am shifting a bit of gears to look into servers a bit. And I'm trying to solve the problem of reliability. How can you trust, how can you know that your file systems are working fine, everything is good in your system? So this talk is about how we detect and intercept file system errors that are going to become a bigger issue in the future, that are going to crash your data. How do we detect them early? Uh, just a quick overview, a file system error happens basically when you cannot access some data that was originally on the disk. Maybe the block where the data was written on the disk got corrupted. Maybe there was a bit flip, uh, some alpha particle coming from the universe that flip a bit and then your data is now broken. Maybe just the checksum don't match anymore. Or maybe there was a file system bug. That, uh, that caused your data to be corrupted on disk, or that uh, means your file system is no longer able to read the data. And this sometimes only affects a file, but it might indicate bigger issues. For instance, if you have one block that is failing, it might mean that your device, your underlying disk, is failing, but you don't know. Um, we, usually when you find an issue, when something is broken in your data center, you have a few options. You're going to replace your disk. In such case, you're going to recover from a backup. You're going to call your, your system administrator, ask them to fix the thing. Another alternative is running a recovery tool that is going to crawl over your file system, try to detect the error, try to fix it. Uh, the problem is uh, tools like FSDK, they need to walk, walk through the entire file system. They are going to check the entire file system for errors. That is time consuming. Sometimes the file system needs to be put offline. It's a, it's a complicated situation when you're dealing with a production system. Uh, obviously, if you look at that image on the right and your disk is in that situation, I would say that it's a bit beyond repair. but. Uh, if before that you can identify that something is broken, then you might have a better chance of fixing it. So the question is not how do I recover in this talk. We have tools to recover, we have mechanisms to recover, we can recover from backup. The question is how do I know that my file system is failing? How do I know that I have an issue in the first place? The first sign that something went wrong is when you get an error code from a system call. And as we all know, a lot of people ignore them. Uh, an error code might be just an e-invol, an EIO coming when you try to do a write or when you try to open a file. And that, using that to monitor file system errors is slightly unreliable because you depend on every application of your system to report it to, up, to upper layers. You need, uh, you need your application, maybe your shell script, 
to check for errors, and some tools simply ignore them silently. Uh, after you get an error code, uh, that information is lost. If the application doesn't do anything with that, it's lost. The other way that you can check for file system errors nowadays is check the kernel log. The kernel log, I'm going to be speaking a bit more about that and why it's problematic, but basically it's a buffer where the entire kernel and some user space dump message above message, message beyond message on the, kernel, on the log, and sometimes things disappear. It's not a very reliable way. Some file systems expose an interface through CSFS where you can look for, uh, at specific files that are going to list the number of errors that occurred. They will provide some information, but none of this is standardized. And still, they, it's not a pullable interface. Uh, at least, uh, uh, this specific error files are not pullable in CSFS. So it's not like you can just set up a daemon and forget. You need to go check for errors. So what people usually do they find something in the mask and then they go look in CSFS for errors or they have a tool that is polling uh, CSFS all the time. Um, by the way, this is what the, the kernel log looks like. It's uh, slightly cryptic, cryptic, but here we see an example of a file system error. Here there was an error in ext4 remount uh, triggered by that PID. Uh, the command that triggered it was mount and a human description of the error uh, abort forced by user. This is obviously not an actual error. This is me crashing my own file system for purposes of demonstration. And then uh, remounting file system read only, which is part of the kernel recovery. So we have a single line here. I don't know if I can point. We have a single line here that actually describes an error in the file system. And that single line is somewhere here. Uh, this is a random picture, a random image of my kernel log that I, that I took while running my machine. The kernel log, I used to say, is no man's land. Any kernel developer, any kernel that is, any patch that is pushed to the kernel can write stuff to the, to the kernel log. And I'm not familiar with anyone in the community who's trying to gatekeep or protect this from anything that is being written, which means that uh, sometimes people put credits of the driver they developed on the kernel log. This is not common, very common nowadays, but you can still find email, email addresses of people on the kernel log. And the problem is it's very noisy. Just in this image, I'm looking here, I have, you can find information about which keyboard I use. You can find information about which headset I use. There is an Apple keyboard there, but I swear I don't use that one. Uh, so definitely the kernel log is not the right tool for monitoring. Uh, in particular, so it's implemented just as a ring buffer. So the main problem issue is that you lose messages. Once the buffer is completely full, you start to lose what was on the top when it wraps and go around and start writing new messages on the top. It's plain text. Well, kind of plain text, but it's still it's a very free form of, uh, of logging. So you have parsing challenges. You need to be able to understand what is written there for any kind of automated, uh, automated testing. It has some challenges, like there, are, there were issues in the past where messages would be wrapped, would be truncated. There was a patch set in 2019 that kind of improved on that, but it's still very problematic. But the main issue is that the kernel log is an unstable API. People change. Uh, their error messages at every release. In this case, if you have an automated tool that is looking at, uh, uh, that is looking at a, a specific error string, you might just not know when that error happened. And it's, it's interesting also that not only the kernel makes it a no man's land, everybody can write to it, but user space can also write to it, depending on the distro, this is blocked nowadays, but uh, if you write to this file in your system, that will go straight into, into the kernel log and might overwrite something more interesting. It also has the same problem as the CSFS uh, file system interface that I mentioned, which is you cannot pull on the error. So you cannot, uh, it's, you, yeah, sorry, you cannot be notified when an error happens. You need to keep checking and checking and checking, which is not ideal for monitoring. 
just a small comment because I, I know some people are going to say it's not exactly like that. Uh, obviously, you can overcome some of these issues. For instance, if you have a daemon that is watching over your kernel log, you can prevent losing messages, but this is not a guarantee. Your monitoring is now going to be just as good as your daemon is uh, fetching information from the log before it's actually overwritten. Uh, there is also the patch set that I mentioned that attempted to improve on this problem. Uh, but as far as I know, and maybe Linux is not here, I don't know about any plan to control what, it, what gets written to the kernel log. So uh, it's very easy to push a patch to the kernel that modifies a message and that's not considered an ABI breakage. So definitely the kernel log is a no-no. In my, in my opinion, and actually I wrote uh, before personal opinion here, uh, relying on the kernel log for any kind of automated monitoring of your data center is actually a terrible, terrible idea. But the, early, re, but the reality is that we do it all the time, and the reason for that is that, well, it's usually the only way. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the kernel log is useless. It's very useful for troubleshooting issues. It's very useful for development. Every developer, every kernel developer in the room, I bet you debug your kernels with printk instead of nicer tools. Uh, but still, it's not the right tool for any automated monitoring. Uh, it, you can see an error message that changed uh, uh, on the kernel log between releases when you are a person looking at it, but for automated monitoring is not right. Okay? And obviously this issue gets worse as you grow in scale. If you are a single Arch Linux user looking at your kernel log, that's fine. You can understand the messages. You can see what changed. If you were Google looking at a huge data center, well, you have a big problem. Uh, so the question here is, how do I solve this problem for data centers, for bigger users? How do I have an automated monitoring tool that can look at the entire data center? Uh, the, the solution that we implemented is based on FA Notify, which is an infrastructure that already exists in the Linux, in the Linux kernel for monitoring file system events. So when a file is accessed, when a file is removed, when a subtree is modified in any way. As far as I know, maybe somebody can correct me in the room, but the original use case for this feature was for antivirus scanning. So basically, you, the monitoring, the scanner, tells, the scanner tells the system I want to be notified anytime a file is created so I can go there and watch and verify this file and check this file. Uh, so, FA Notify is quite an interesting tool to solve this problem because it has an, uh, a model of objects that allows you to connect to a specific file, to a specific di directory, to a specific mount point, or to the entire file system. Uh, and it's very low overhead, which means that when it's disabled, when you don't care about monitoring, it will have basically zero overhead, but you can quickly attach to a specific subtree of the system. Uh, I, I investigated a few alternatives. I considered implementing uh, a custom uh, notification event. I looked at watch events, but there is, there, this is the reason I went with FA Notify, which is how well it ties already with the file system. Uh, so basically what I did was I extended FA Notify to support a new error type called FanFS error. Which, now, which is now triggered every time that something happens that shouldn't happen on your file system. So every time that the file system code detects an issue, it's going to create an FanFS error event. And that error is very extensible. It has already a lot of information, but it can be extended. So it basically tells you where the error happened, which file, which directory. It tells you what kind of error happened and a, a little bit of extra uh, metadata. But the point is, it's extensible. So say that a file system in the future uh, wants to do online repair, for instance, it could simply notify the, the FSEK tool for that file system of exactly what went wrong so the tool can go straight to that I know and fix it without already knowing, without having to investigate by itself what went wrong. There are many applications for this interface in online repair of file systems. Uh, 
basically, the implementation has to be file system specific because every file system has different errors. There are errors who don't just don't make sense on some file systems and on others they do. So this implementation is file system specific. I implemented support for ext4, which is what we use in production for a specific customer. Uh, and this support has been upstream for half a year now. It went out on the 516. Uh, and the way we implemented it is that it mirrors the errors that are reported on your kernel log for your file system. So now you, you, it, so it's easy to migrate, it's easy to go straight into this feature instead of continue to rely on kernel monitoring for that file system. You have all the errors that you cared about now exposed to this interface. And the error looks like this. This is a tracer that I wrote that just connects to the, to the interface and prints out the information that it has. This is uh, the beginning of the, of the information. It basically tells you, so here I'm watching for, I'm running my tool against this mount point, which could be just the root of my file system, of my system here. So I'm monitoring everything inside that file system. This is per file system. So if you have a, a sub mount, you need to, to run that against it too. Uh, this is the error that, uh, that was generated, the event. This uniquely identifies the file system. It's the FSID that you can recover from FSTAT. This is a file handler, handle, sorry. This is a file handle. And what it does is it uniquely identifies an object in your file system. In ext4, for instance, is basically the inode number plus the generation. So with this, you can quickly tie it to this specific object in my file system has an error. Uh, and then it prints what was the error type. Uh, this is a generic, uh, it's not involved. What error is this, EIO? I don't know what error is this. But obviously, this is dependent on your file system. So you need to go look at it to figure out what is going wrong. Uh, and then it prints the error count. One specific detail about file system errors is that when something goes wrong, uh, you sometimes have a lot of errors that get dumped and they overwrite your entire kernel buffer in a single row and you lose the original information. Because one error in a file can pro quickly propagate and if you try to open that file repeatedly, it's gonna is gonna just dump a lot of noise into your kernel log. So instead, we only record the first error that happened for that specific file, which allows us to only focus on the information that matters. When you have a file system error, usually it's the only error that you care is the first error that appeared, and this is what we are catching here. But still, it provides for statistics, and I, I know people who are doing statistic, statistics on this, uh, the number of errors that happened. Uh, this is another example. This is actually the error that I trigger at the beginning of the talk when I show the kernel log. It now becomes this. It tells you that this is a super block error and it's error 108, which on ext4 is uh, translated as ext4 something abort. Um, and this also has the FSID. It doesn't have any file handle because this was an error in the file system itself. So in the super block of the file system and it's not tied to a specific inode. Uh, all the documentation is there. I see one immediate use for this, which is uh, desktop managers and uh, look using this information to notify the user and tell them you need to run FSCK, you need to go recover from a backup. Obviously, there is the a data center monitoring use case where you are um, looking at a huge fleet of machines and making sure that your uh, data is not corrupted, that your volumes are all safe. Uh, I also see a very interesting use case for this on online repairing. So in this documentation, I provide uh, information on how to use this feature focus specifically for user space developers who are attempting to implement these uh, monitors for this. And there is also a code sample in the kernel tree that I used to generate the previous uh, example. Um, finally, some future work. As I said, the interface is extensible, which means that uh, you could, for instance, 
add, one information that I really want to add there is the line and the number of line that, uh, where the error occurred, so we can link it directly. There is some ob objection from the community there because it's not such a great use case. But uh, I know people who are doing statistics on, the, um, on which errors fail the most, so paths that needs to be further improved, and that would be an interesting use case for us to have. There is also the possibility of exposing a file system specific blob, which allow, would allow us, for instance, I know XFS might be able to use that for online repair. And another future work, which is very important, I, I would say the first one, I'm actually working on some patches for this, is to support it on more file systems. This, there is nothing here There is ext4 specific, except that it's only implemented for ext4. As an next target, I would like to see this in ButterFS. I'm I've been writing some patches for this, and it's quite a trivial interface for the file system. Basically, when you detect an error, you just go and call this function, passing the super block, the object, the URI node, and which error happens. And there is an example patch here if you want to look at it and try to implement it for your own file system. It's very trivial. It's basically a four lines patch, and all the lines are the same, just calling this in different places. Um, so this is the feature that I wrote, but I, 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 when, I, when I was preparing this talk, I, I kept thinking, like, could, could I have done it slightly better? And what bugs me is that when we look at ways to notify the kernel from user space, we have so many ways to do it. You can check CFS, you can look at the kernel log. We have I notify, D notify, FA notify, netlink. We have watch queue, which is quite a cool thing. And then when I was, researching and trying to see how I could implement this, I bumped into this interface from BSD, which is basically a generic queue uh, from, users, from the kernel to user space where you can send events, you can be notified about different event types, uh, you can filter events inside the kernel. It's quite a neat interface. And I was like, yeah, uh, we don't have an equivalent in the kernel, but turns out that we do. Uh, so in 2020, David Howells proposed uh, WatchQ, which is a generic event interface, is not tied to any subsystem. And the idea is to make it uh, generic enough that can be used by several subsystems. It's all, it already supports event filtering. I think there is some work to be done there for, I don't know, BPF filter or whatever. Uh, I, I said BPF in the talk, so kudos, uh, self kudos. And this is already merged, this is already available in the kernel, uh, but right now it's only used for keyring management. But it's still in the early days, it's been merged in 2020, and there is a reason I couldn't use this, which is, well, the object model by FA Notify makes it ideal for any kind of file system monitoring. This cannot be hooked to a specific file system yet. But I think it's a very promising interface, it's worth mentioning, and I think it's a much better solution to uh, the very specific notification things that we have in the kernel. Uh, so this is my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm open to questions, but before that, I just wanted to say that Collabora, as I said, is, a, is an open source consultancy that works on many interesting things in particular. Well, when I joined Collabora, I started working on so many interesting topics that I ended up speaking at uh, oops, open source summits around the globe every year for all of these topics. Uh, and we actually do some very interesting things. We have uh, customers on most different areas. We don't do only kernel, we also do a lot of graphics, a lot of multimedia work, and we are hiring, so if you're interested in the kind of work that I presented here today or that my colleagues have presented in this conference, uh, feel free to apply. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, can I answer any questions? Are there any questions? Hey, um, so when you showed the, the error and it's just like error 117, you were talking about linking it back to, um, to lines of code and a way to more uniquely identify them. Um, is that the direction where it's just sort of, no. here is the place in the code where a thing happened or is there something going on sort of more like, the, I guess thinking like smart where it's, you know, generic classes of error, right? 
Yeah, so here is the error that was returned at that point. So it's, uh, in this case, is an exe4 specific error. Yeah. Uh, we don't have the information about the line of code that, uh, that triggered this error. Mm -hmm. This is future work. It's something that I'm, I'm working on. We, I have a patch for that, but it wasn't accepted. Uh, I still need to do some work there to have that specific information. Yeah, but there's nothing like, you know, across different file systems or across, like you have sort of with storage where across the industry there's sort of generic classes of, of error. And no, there's that is going to be, standardized, like. that is going to be very, very file system specific. Okay, right. cool. Uh, there, are, there are some, well, there are errors that wouldn't make sense in other file systems. So, for instance, I have this block group. That, uh, that has an issue, block group is not a structure that exists in a different file system. So it's not standardized, unfortunately. We could do better here, but it's not. Cool, thank you. Hi. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, is there support for X2 and X3 by extension of it being added into X4? Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, no. So, uh, no. Actually, that's a good question. I think so, because they shared some code. Is John around? John around? No. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I haven't tested it on the X2, but I don't know if the code is shared. Is the code shared for the X2? I, th I thought there was some commonality, but yes. I'm not very familiar with the area. I can check. Okay, so uh, no, definitely not. There is not supported on the XT2, I think X3. XT3, yes, but not XT2. XT3 is implemented by XT4, right? Not the XT2. So, no. Sure. Uh, sorry, there is a question there. Uh, just a remark. Um, you mentioned, so structured logging approach is great if you have it. Um, sometimes you cannot afford that. And you mentioned earlier that the, the kernel log is not an ABI. Um, that's unfortunately true. But um, since 5.15, there's been an interesting feature called print K indexing. Um, where during build process, um, all print K format strings get collected into a special off section. And you can at least alert if, uh, alert if a new kernel build does not fit any of your patterns anymore. So I found that to be quite useful. Agreed, that improves a lot the situation. Uh, it doesn't solve all of the issues though, but I, it's, a great, it's a great improvement. It, it's just a band-aid. Um, yeah. Doing kernel specific work uh, doesn't scale to having many system engineers, but writing rec ex, uh, expressions, regular expressions does, so. Yes, it's true. It makes it a bit more palatable. So thanks for your work. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, other file systems like ZFS and some write zip systems have they separate file file system logs inside the file system which contains these error messages like that. So, do you think that this approach is better than if that those file system specific logs or? I think, what do you uh, think about this? I think it's different use cases, right? Here we are thinking about how we notify the user that something happened. I think uh, logging it inside the file system is also, is also, is also important. But uh, here is about how do we tell the user that something crashed without the user having to uh, pull for it. Okay. So, if there are no other questions, thank you.